Well, this last week, did you all have a good week? Yes. Stress-free? Yes. No troubles? I had a, a, an almost really good week, except for Tuesday. Tuesday was not a good day. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details because you, you, became, you came here to be encouraged in Christ today, so I'm not going to you know, stress you with my stress. But Tuesday, I had what uh, that one child's book talked about, the, the low-down, dirty, rotten, horrible, bad, terrible day, you know, that book. Uh, I had that day Tuesday, and uh, I went to a county board of supervisors meeting. That's all I'm going to say. So I went to that meeting, experienced some rather negative emotions, and was driving back here to the church after the meeting, and I was praying my brains out. I was really angry at something I perceived to be really wrong. And so I was praying, and God gave me this profound gift. Now, I don't know if you've prayed and God's answered your prayer so powerfully that you, know, you literally felt your guts change. I experienced that Tuesday because I was having that dirty, rotten, terrible, no good, horrible day, and God literally changed me from the inside out. I'm not saying that because I'm your pastor and I'm trying to make myself sound good. If I told you all the details, you'd probably be scared of your pastor, like how evil is your pastor that he got that angry. Uh, I had somebody come up to me after the first service and literally tell me, back it off just a bit. You're scaring us, man. So I'm not going to go into all the detail that I did with the first service. Just, I'll just tell you honestly, I was really mad. God gave me peace. And it came out of this one reality that I'm going to share with you this morning. This is a one-word version of the entire gospel. The word I'm going to teach you this morning, the reality of this word, the power of this word is what turned the Old Testament into the New Testament. It changed everything. This word is the power of the literal gospel of Jesus in one word. So if you want to learn the whole gospel in just one word, if you want to preach an entire sermon with one word, this is the only word you need. Of course, it, it helps if you know what the word means. Because if I teach you the word and you don't know what it means, it's useless, right? So like me teaching you a, a word in a foreign language and you say it with somebody that speaks that language and they go, ooh, you know, they walk away from you because you said the bad word. So I'm going to teach you the good word and I'm going to teach you what it means so you can actually share the gospel anywhere, anytime by speaking one word. Here's the word. Propitiation. Propitiation. Now I'd like you to say this with me because I know this is not a word you commonly use. Have you heard this word at all this last week? Did you watch CNN and hear it? No. Could you probably stood in line in the supermarket and hear anybody converse with propitiation? No. Okay, so let's say this out loud on the count of three. We're all going to get on the same page here. We're going to say it out loud on the count of three. And here's the thing. Say it like you mean it, okay? One, two, three. Propitiation. Good job. All right. So now we're to dive into what this really means. And I want you to open your Bibles to 1 John 4.10. 1 John 4.10. 1 John 4.10. Just before Revelation. 1 John 4.10. Now all of verse 4, or excuse me, all of chapter 4 is awesome. It's talking about the love of God and how he changes us. But I'm just going to focus on verse 10, Okay. I think maybe today you can read all of 1 John 4 because it's beautiful. Verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. Powerful word. It's used in the New Testament in strategic places. In Romans 3.25, Jesus is said to have displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. So God actually displayed Jesus on the cross, shedding his blood for us as our propitiation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Jesus makes propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus had no sin to pay for himself, but you and I have plenty of sins to be paid for. Jesus paid for our sins. 1 John 2, 
chapter, chapter 2, verse 2. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and the whole world. Propitiation is an amazing, powerful reality. It is not just a dusty theological word that you have to go to seminary to learn. It's in the New Testament for you and I. It's for everybody. This word is the gospel in one word. And here's the cool thing about it. It is powerful. It's all-encompassing. It's for everybody on this planet. Jesus volunteered for this mission to be the propitiation for our sins and for the sins of every person you've ever known. For the sins of every person you've never met. For every person on this planet. Jesus is the propitiation. Now, you're not impressed yet, are you? Because you don't even know what it means. Like, okay. You ever have anybody tell you what was really exciting news for them? And you want to be happy for them, but you're not feeling it because you have no clue why they're so happy about what they just told you? And you're sitting there right now like, Steve, why are you so happy about this? Because I can't even say the word, let alone be happy about it. So what's the big deal? Well, let's dive into what it actually means. The fullness of this word. This word is like getting a seven-course meal at the fanciest restaurant on the planet. You know how much that would cost you? A oh, fortune, right? So God paid the price for this meal for us, and it's huge. And here's where we start. The basic meaning of this word is to make atonement for. To atone for something. To make the payment. To atone for. And, and you're like, okay, that's a, a nice biblical word. Okay, let's keep going. To make atonement for, first part of it. Second part of it, to make amends for an injury or wrong. For instance... You drive to the supermarket, you park your car or your truck, you open your car door, and you bang the car next to you. Now, you didn't mean to, but you didn't realize how close you were, so you open your door and you bang your door. Now, if they're driving a 1972 Pinto that's all rusted out and beat up, you don't feel too bad, do you? But if you just bang the brand new 2014 Ferrari and you put a little dent in the door, how do you feel? Like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, right? Okay, Jesus, in it, making propitiation for us, literally covers that wrong. He pays to get that dent repaired. He repairs the injury that we did. How do you feel about that? You just did an accident, right? You just created a problem for somebody else in their brand new car, and somebody else comes to pay for it. Like, oh, hold, don't keep your wallet right there. I'm, I'm going to take care of this. Right? And you go, wow, how cool is that? Because I can't even afford the deductible for the paint for this car, let alone the mechanic that's going to do it, right? So Jesus paid to repair the injury you caused. Is it getting a little more powerful for you? You created the problem. He fixed it. Now, when you're a little kid, your parents do this all the time, right? When you're an adult, you know you're an adult when you cause a problem and you got to fix it and you don't always have the ability to fix it, do you? And you're like, oh, life stinks, you know? Bank account's empty. I've got no ability. I've got no skill. I've got no hope. There's, you know, what do you do, right? You're stuck. Jesus comes along. It's like the people that are going up to ski right now because all the new snow, and they're getting stuck in the snow, getting stuck off the road, and they need a tow truck to come get them. They can't pull their you know, car out of the snow by themselves. That's all of us. We've all gone off the road. We've crashed down the mountain. We're stuck in the trees now. There's no way we're getting our car back home. Jesus comes along. He repairs the injury. That's propitiation. You're helpless. He miraculously, show, he miraculously shows up and solves your problem. 
That's propitiation. He makes amends. He does the repairs. He makes the atonement. And he makes it personal because the third part of this is to make reconciliation. Reconciliation between God and man. Between you and the holy God in heaven who is perfect, holy, sinless, always does what is right. And you and I who do not always do what is right. And so God's in heaven, perfect. We're on earth, not perfect. And Jesus reconciles the gulf between us. He bridges that impossible Grand Canyon-sized hole that exists because of our sin between us and God. And so he covers that with himself. He brings us together. So we're no longer apart from God. We're now part of God's family. We're adopted into his family. We've been reconciled. We've been brought together. The problem that existed that separated us has now been healed. And if you've ever had a problem with a human being where you had a fight and you never wanted to see them or hear from them again, you know what it's like to not be reconciled. The gulf and the break in the relationship is always painful. And then Jesus comes along and he solves the problem. He brings the reconciliation. Where you and I have no ability to bring reconciliation because Quite frankly, sometimes we don't even want to hear that person's voice ever again, right? They made us so mad or they wronged us so deeply. And Jesus comes along and he repairs the injury. He makes amends. He brings reconciliation, not only between people, but between us and God. But the application of this is between us and people. The fourth part of propitiation is to create harmony out of discord. Anybody here ever play a musical instrument? Anybody? Just raise your hand. If you ever played a musical instrument, raise your hand. Most of you. Cool. Now, you know what it's like to play your instrument out of tune? Right? Doesn't sound good, does it? I want you to imagine you're all part of a symphony. All of you are now in the South Side Symphony. And you all have your instrument. But every single one of you are out of tune. Doesn't, good, doesn't matter which music we play, does it? It could be Beethoven. We're not going to sound good, do we? Because we're all out of tune. So if you have the master conductor, God, Jesus, who comes down here and puts you all in tune, then we can make beautiful music, right? That's propitiation. Jesus takes every one of us who live by faith in him. We come to faith in him. And we haven't earned it. We haven't deserved it. And we haven't done it any good thing, right? All we've done is receive the salvation he gives us. He puts us in tune. He creates harmony out of our discord. Now, as a believer, you're now following Jesus. You love Jesus. You know you've been forgiven. You're part of the body of Christ. You love your brothers and sisters in Christ most of the time. And you do something without even meaning to, right? An accident that hurts a brother or sister's in Christ's feelings. You've insulted them. You've hurt them. You, you broke a promise. You gossiped without meaning to. You, you did something. And maybe you don't even realize you did it. They just really got hurt. Propitiation stops that discord and creates harmony, brings reconciliation, makes amends, heals. That's what propitiation does. You and I are not perfect, except as we live by faith in Christ. And as we live by faith in Christ, He creates us as a new creation in Him, and He's creating harmony out of our discords. All the false or wrong notes that we hit, He recreates. He harmonizes. He takes us in our weaknesses, and recreates us to maturity and completeness in Him. So we sound beautiful in His symphony. Amen is right. You and I can't do this on our own. In Christ, He takes us and He makes us new creations individually and collectively. He does this work in propitiation for all of us. 
And not only does he create harmony out of our discord, but he made himself to be the sacrifice to remove our sins. Now we all know, you know, Easter's coming up, and we, we know Easter is all about Jesus dying on the cross and raising from the dead, and we celebrate that. But do you realize what it cost Jesus? He didn't just put a few bucks in the offering plate for our sins. He didn't send, you know, an animal to die on a sacrificial altar for our sins. He made himself the sacrifice completely for our sins. This last week as I'm I'm preparing this message, I'm praying about this, I'm studying this, I'm learning this, and I'm taking this in, and it's impacting me because of Tuesday. This is a deeply impactful message for me and what I experienced Tuesday. Because out of my discord, Jesus brought harmony. Out of my frustration and anger and pain, he brought peace. Jesus literally made this real for me Tuesday. You and I very seldom ever willingly sacrifice ourselves for somebody else, especially somebody else that doesn't deserve it. You know what I'm saying? Now, there are people we'll sacrifice for, people we like, people we love, our own children, right? You'll sacrifice, you'll give your own life for your child or your grandchild, you'd do anything for them, right? How about your enemy? This is real for me because there was one particular man that said one particular sentence in that Board of Supervisors meeting that I took to be a pure lie. An official of our government actually spoke an untruth. Now you're laughing. I wasn't laughing. And I left that meeting really ticked off. Now, we all have spoken lies. We've all hurt other people. We've all sinned. Jesus made himself the sacrifice for that man in that meeting. Jesus made himself the sacrifice for you, for me, for every person in the Middle East, for all the people in the Ukraine, in Russia right now that are possibly going to war. For every person on this planet, Jesus made it personal because he came and literally gave his entire body, his entire being, his entire life, all his blood for them and for you and for me. And Jesus is inviting us to literally live this way, to live sacrificially ourselves. I invite you to go home this afternoon and open your Bibles and read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Read Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's not in your sermon notes. Just a little gift I'm offering to you. See the invitation Jesus is giving us to live as a living sacrifice. The next part of propitiation, that the power of it is that God uses propitiation to restore a relationship between God and man. We already talked about reconciliation, but now we're talking about restoring, not just bringing together. Because God does what you and I can't do. When you're polar opposites, when you're, on, you're so far on other extremes from other people on a particular political point of view, which happens a lot in our country, Jesus brings opposites together, right? People that can't stand each other, he brings them together, makes them one, reconciles them. But the power of propitiation isn't just bringing opposites together, it is restoring relationship where it's been completely destroyed or non-existent. Jesus restores relationship in propitiation. Do you have any relationships that need to be restored? Jesus does this. In World War II, the Nazis in Germany worked very hard to systematically destroy the Jewish people. Killed more than six million 
That's, that's a number that you can't even imagine, can you? Six million murdered. Not to mention all the other people they killed because they killed more. Jesus work propitiation to restore those relationships between the people that survived the camps, those death camps, and the guards who tortured them and murdered them in those death camps. Can you imagine being one of those Jews who survived the camp, but all your family was killed in that camp? And a year after the war is done and you're now living a, a normal life, right? You meet one of those guards in a worship service like this. What do you do? How do you feel? Because you remember the death of your sister, the death of your mother, the death of your father in that camp. And you see that guard who tortured your sister. What do you do? You, by yourself, don't have the ability to restore that relationship, do you? But through Jesus' propitiation, he gives us that restored relationship. It's his death on the cross and his shed blood that takes people that hated and murdered each other and brings them together and makes them brothers and sisters in Christ. We can't do this apart from Jesus. This is a miraculous work of God. And that's why Jesus came here. This is the power of propitiation. He restores relationships. And the last part of propitiation is something we need to take into full consideration because Jesus paid in full the payment and the penalty for our sin. He, he satisfied and removed all of God's holy and just wrath against all sin. He satisfied it, he paid it, he removed it. This is where I scared people in the first service because I, I started talking about my anger and what I wanted to do uh, after that meeting. And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> well, I'm not going to scare you. Uh, but here's the cool thing. Jesus paid in full all of God's holy and just wrath against sin. I don't have to get angry at bonehead sinners. God hates sin more than I do. Amen is right. That's also a terrifying thing. Scripture says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. So because we're all sinners, you know what we all deserve. Hell. Literally. But Jesus paid that penalty. In full. He's not making monthly payments on it. When you die, there's not a little bit left to pay off. You know, we're not put in layaway when we die. When we die, we get to be with God immediately. There's no purgatory. Jesus paid it in full. So God is not angry at you. Do you hear that? God is not angry with you. Look back at 1 John 4.10. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God loves you. 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 Matter of fact, you should just turn to each other right now. I mean, literally, I want you to do this. Turn to each other right now and with meaning say, God loves you. God really does love you, you bonehead sinner. He loves you. He made propitiation for you. He took all of your sins and got rid of them. They're removed. They don't exist anymore. You are guiltless. You are holy. You are set free. You are now a holy saint in the eyes of God. Thank you, Jesus is right. How do you feel now? Pretty good, right? Now, when God removes all of his wrath against our sin, 
Do you ever have the right to be angry at somebody that does a little thing against you? No. It's like somebody does something wrong against me, so, you know, they owe me a dollar. And I sin against God, and I owe him $20 trillion. Whose debt's bigger? Right? So if God forgave me that much, I should be willing to forgive those little things people do against me. <laughs> Amen. So this is where God gave me healing Tuesday late afternoon, Wednesday morning, Thursday, as I'm writing this message. God healed me. He took away that man's sin. And I have no wrath against that man. Literally, I'm now hoping to meet this guy someday. I want to buy him a cup of coffee. I want to be a blessing to this guy. Because this is where propitiation ends up. This is where propitiation grows deep roots and bears fruit. It's real when we live it. This is how God loved us. And as followers of Jesus, this is how we love. And so Jesus gave us this example. This is not new. You've heard this before. First thing, what's the greatest commandment? Love one another as a follower of Jesus. We love God and we love each other, right? It's the greatest commandment. Now, it's pretty easy to love the person sitting next to you right now, most of the time. Mo yeah, mm -hmm. most of the time. We generally like each other here, right? I mean, I'm looking out at you, and I go, yep, I like you, yep, I like you, I really like you. And I like hanging out with you people. I love being together. This is awesome. Let's get together and have a potluck, right? This is all good. I like you. You like me, I think. So this is good. But there are people on this planet you really can't stand. There's people on this planet I really can't stand. They get on my last nerve. They don't even have to try, right? Propitiation restores that broken relationship, rights the wrong, creates harmony out of the discord. That's propitiation. And now I can buy that guy in that meeting a cup of coffee and want to love him instead of wanting to strangle him, right? God gives us this ability. This is the propitiation of Jesus Christ that we live by faith in him. He gave us this gift so that we can live it. We follow him so we love, and we love not just the people we like. We love our enemies. We reach out like Jesus. Jesus literally lived this, didn't he? You know that everywhere Jesus went, he dealt with people that were enemies. He loved the Romans. He loved the Samaritans. He loved the sinners who were guilty, caught, right, red-handed in their guilt. And Jesus restored them. Jesus gave kindness to them. Jesus gave compassion to them. Jesus lived propitiation. And this is how we're to live. This is the power of our faith in Christ lived in our weak flesh. You want the power of God in your life? Live propitiation. Love your enemies. Like Jesus did when he's hanging on the cross and he looked down at the men who had just nailed him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they just did. Jesus commanded us, and you have a little typo, though, in your notes. It says Matthew 6, 44. It's after you, Matthew 5, 44. I'm a bad proof for you. It's Matthew 5, 44. Love our enemies. It's a command from Jesus. He lived the power of propitiation. And we are to live it as we follow him. So this is the law of the kingdom of God that we are to live in every day. This is his calling to us as followers of him to live here and now. This isn't something that Jesus did once and it's never supposed to happen again. We are now to live it by our faith in Jesus. And this is the three ways we do it. It's very simple. We start off with humble love. We know how much God's forgiven us. So in humility of receiving the grace of God, we humbly love others. Humility, identifying with other people as fragile and broken as we are. I'm a crackpot. You can laugh, it's okay. I am. And, and so are you. And you know how you treat a, a piece of fine china that you got from your great-great-grandmother, you know, a little teacup that might have a crack in it? You treat it very gently. So that's how we live with each other. 
in this broken world. Everybody in this world is a broken pot because of sin. So we have humility and love in how we treat other people in this world. And then we live self-sacrificing as Jesus did. Jesus literally was pierced and crushed like a lamb led to slaughter for all of us. And in Isaiah 53 and Leviticus 17, 11, that's how we're to live. Now, you don't have to allow yourself to be nailed to a cross to pay for somebody else's sins because your blood's not perfect to start with, so you can't pay their price. Jesus did. But we follow his example in how we live daily so we can sacrificially love the people around us like Jesus literally did. So humble love, self-sacrificing love, and then last, seek to be a blessing. I'm finding this amazing right now. I think this is a miracle of God in our day. I haven't read this anywhere, but I, I'm seeing glimpses of this everywhere in the secular world. I'm hearing people in Hollywood, of all places, talking about being a blessing that they don't live just for themselves, but every day they seek to be a blessing to someone else. And they're not Christians. But God is breaking through into their hearts and minds, and they're getting the reality and the power of what it means to bless someone else instead of just seeking to get. They're seeking to give. And that's how Jesus lived every day, didn't he? Everywhere Jesus went and in every interaction he had with every person, whether it's a woman or a man or children, Jesus sought to give a blessing to improve someone else's life in God. And you and I can live this way in little ways and big ways. It doesn't really take much, does it, to bless someone? A small act of kindness a small act of thoughtfulness. It could be holding a door open for somebody that doesn't expect it. Something to just give them a little taste of the love of God to brighten their day. You don't do it for yourself, you do it for them. This is how Jesus lived. This is being propitiation. This is the power of the gospel. You can live this and draw people to God by the kindness of God living in you. Amen? So now you know the gospel in one word. Propitiation. And you can enjoy this word in communion right now. We're going to take communion. We're going to share the symbols of the, the broken body of Jesus in the bread and the shed blood of Jesus in the cup. And as we take this bread and we take this, this juice, you're symbolically taking it all that Jesus is all that he lived, all that he did, and all that, all that he will be doing in the future, all of his supernatural goodness and life and love and forgiveness and healing and propitiation, you're going to drink and eat that into all that you are so that you can live it in all that you are. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer. It's the ABCD prayer. I'm going to pray it right now for all of us. I invite you to bow your hearts and bow your heads with me and join in this prayer. Father God, I thank you for 1 John 4.10. I thank you for this word that is so unique and powerful. Lord, I admit before your holy throne that I'm a sinner, that I need the propitiation of Jesus every day. Father God, I believe that Jesus Christ is God and that he died on the cross for my sins and the sins of the whole world. I confess before all these people and, Lord, everybody I know, I confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. He is my God and my Savior, my Redeemer. And, Father, I ask you to help me and help all of us right now. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and bring your word, especially the, the meaning of the word propitiation, into our minds and plant it deeply so that it lives and grows and bears fruit in us so that I can be a living disciple of Jesus, becoming more like him and, and living in the power of propitiation, that I can be a blessing to others and share your love 
and your life, Jesus, with them. Lord Jesus, as we take communion now, we thank you for hearing this prayer, for answering this prayer, and for being our most miraculous propitiation, even in this moment. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your propitiation for us. Amen.